The world continues to watch Libya, and during this week's World Have Your Say, we're going to bring you the very latest on the situation there. Helping us tell the story will be reporters on the ground, the world's biggest news agencies, and of course, some of you. If you are Libyan, whether inside or outside of your country, if you can help us tell this story, do call us, the number will be on the screen. Or if any of you are tweeting, use the wise hashtag and we'll pick up your comments. Of course, we're going to be concentrating on reporting the story, but we'll also take time to discuss if this week's events have justified NATO's intervention, and if all of you have faith in the National Transitional Council being able to deliver a safe and a stable Libya. And if you are watching in Libya, or indeed you're elsewhere, but think you can help with our coverage, the number to call is country code 442070837272. We'll call you back so you won't have to pay for very much of the call at all. Now, let's get the latest from Libya. There has been sporadic fighting continuing in Tripoli, and the search is going on for Colonel Gaddafi. He's remaining defiant and has used his spokesman to reiterate that he's still in command of the country. Meanwhile, rebel fighters are making slow progress in their advance on Gaddafi's hometown of Siert. This despite assistance from the British, who carried out overnight missile attacks on a large bunker in the city. Elsewhere, at least 16 people have been killed in a suicide attack at the UN's building in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. 60 people have been taken to hospital, and many of them are in a critical condition. According to eyewitnesses, the bomber drove a car through security barriers and then crashed into the building. Anti-government activists in Syria say that forces loyal to President Bashar al-Assad fired at protesters in a Damascus suburb after Friday prayers. They've also organized demonstrations today in various other Syrian cities. New figures released in the United States suggest that the economy almost came to a halt in the first six months of this year. That has cut the country's annual growth forecast. We'll find out what the U.S. Federal Reserve head Ben Bernanke thinks about that a little later. He's addressing a conference of international bankers. And the U.S. East Coast is preparing for Hurricane Irene. Seven states, including North Carolina, Connecticut and New York, have declared a state of emergency with many people urged to evacuate ahead of landfall. I'll just reiterate again, if you're watching in Libya and want to help us tell the story, the number to call is country code 44 2070 83 72 72. Let me introduce you to Amal Tahouni. She works at the Libyan Embassy in London and she joins us live. Amal, thanks for being on World Have Your Say. Pleasure, thank you. I'm curious, um, which flag is flying over the Libyan Embassy in London at the moment? The, the, the flag of independence, the flag of the revolution is flying very proudly over the British Embassy in London. It was raised some time ago and it's been waving very proudly ever since. And you'll have heard um, in the news, I'm sure, over the past couple of hours that the African Union has said it won't be uh, recognizing the rebels. Jacob Zuma, the South African president, has said the situation's too fluid. Can you uh, support the African Union's position? The African Union, you know, made a decision and we will uphold that. We, I expect it's only a matter of time before they come round, but, you know, they are free to decide as and when they see fit. It's not very helpful, though, is it? It really is just a matter of time. I mean, recognition from the world community has, has, has taken time, has taken a lot of effort from members of the NTC, and so we're relatively confident that it really is just a matter of time. If those other countries, you know, who have yet to decide to recognize, we, we have every confidence that it purely is a matter of time, and so, you know, there's no disappointment. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Stay with us. Um, let me pull up this email from Ahmed in Tripoli. He's emailed the BBC to say, we're on the edge of a humanitarian crisis. Water's been cut off. Gunfire is constant. The rebels are acting like maniacs with AK-47s. It's chaos. Well, the issue, the issue of the behaviour of the rebels is one we could possibly raise with the BBC's Lise Doucette. She's in Tripoli and will be joining us live in a few minutes' time here on World Have Your Say to answer some of your questions. In the meantime, let's bring in Sundes, who's a Libyan living in Manchester in the north of England. Sundes, what have you heard from friends and family back home? 
Um, well, they're ecstatic. They're extremely happy. I was actually talking to my auntie about an hour ago um, who called me, so it seems that the lines are back again. Um, and she's very happy. She's a totally different person. Um, I, can, I can actually hear the sound of freedom and liberation in her voice. And for the first time in a long time, she's openly speaking and not afraid to say anything. Um, and, you know, she's talking about going to be family in Masrata soon, which means that hopefully, you know, um, that, that the, the, the whole of Libya will be liberated and, and people will be free to travel from and uh, back and from uh, cities within Libya. And uh, like I say, she's absolutely ha happy. I mean, I spoke to my uncle as well um, yesterday. And again, he's on the streets and he's helping to clean up and whatnot. And again, he's really happy and he's really excited. Um, slightly apprehensive because there's pockets of resistance, but he says that they're going to be uh, under control very soon, hopefully. Well, I can hear the euphoria and excitement in your voice, Sundays, but I wonder, Amal, whether uh, Sundays and others might want to be more cautious about this because while Colonel Gaddafi is on the back foot, many challenges lie ahead, don't they? Of course, many challenges lie ahead, you know, and people are cautiously optimistic, but it's very hard to explain to people, as Sundays has, the euphoria you feel when you're, be, when you're able to talk to family in Tripoli and they themselves are able to talk freely, that it's for anyone that hasn't experienced it, trying to have a regular conversation and, and get them to explain how they genuinely feel about matters. It's such a relief to be able to finally contact people and have them speak freely and hear them for once be genuinely happy. Cautious, absolutely, and no one is at all you know, dismissing the many challenges that, that still lie ahead for the entire country. But still, that sense of relief just to know that the regime is, you know, at its wit's end now. There is no coming back for Gaddafi. And that in itself, you know, let them enjoy that moment. Well, you mentioned the difficulties with communication uh, with Libya. The World Have Your Say team are continually trying to get uh, a great many Libyans who have approached the BBC onto the phone. Uh, it's proving quite hard, but we have made a connection to Kanal, who lives in Tripoli. Kanal, can you describe how the past few days have been for you in your part of the city? Well, um, uh, in the place where I live, in the, in the last two days, uh, there, were, uh, there was lots of shooting, um, you know, um, and, and snipers uh, everywhere. Um, of course, I, I can't go to the city centre, you know, because uh, the situation is dangerous, but uh, we hear a lot of uh, shooting and, and bombing and, and things like that. But um, yeah, yesterday and today, things... Uh, have become much quieter uh, than, than the last two or three days. So uh, I think the situation is improving now. But uh, of course, the um, electric electricity supply is cut off. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the water supply, no water, no electricity. And um, of course, the food as well. Um, uh, people have, uh, have bought some, some food. Uh, before before things have erupted here in Tripoli, uh, but of course this is going to um, uh, yeah, this is going to to, to finish in, 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 in a few days. And so, so um, Kanal, you're saying that there's no electricity at the moment. There are problems with the water. You're concerned about the amount of food that's available. And as you're talking on the screen, we're seeing footage of fighting from the Abu Salim area of Tripoli and we do understand that the rebels on the whole now have that area under their control. I wonder if the fighting has reached your part of the city. Has it affected your life? Uh, well, I mean, the area, the area where I live, which is near the football stadium, uh, there hasn't been much, much fighting, but, but uh, um, you know, uh, the, the fighting was, was uh, focused um, you know, near, near the centre, uh, I mean, some, some areas like uh, Asrim Road in Mansoura, um, uh, North Lien, uh, Fashloum, uh, these are the hot areas. And then, of course, Muslim yesterday. Uh, so the uh, Libyan youth revolutionists uh, uh, went to Muslim yesterday, and uh, the, the, there was an intense fighting. But, uh, you know, today everything is calm. Um, a, f a friend of mine who lives in that area uh, was with me um, about 10 minutes, 15, 10 minutes ago, and he said today uh, things are very calm, and, and uh, some of the um, uh, Gaddafi loyalists have, have fled uh, to, to an area called Gaza bin Mashir. And of course, there are lots of um, uh, lots of people dead, injured, and, and dead people, you know. 
uh, they, they, they were scattered on, on the uh, on the on the road, and uh, the, uh, the scene in the hospital is full of uh, mm. dead bodies and you know and injured people. So you're saying that there remain dead bodies um, on the road that you're seeing injured people, um, but Canal, you're mentioning the cost um, of this conflict without mentioning uh, the cost to your family, because I know that we spoke a couple of days ago on World Have Your Say's radio edition, and you were telling me that your brother was killed on Sunday. Um, perhaps for yeah. our viewers, you could tell us what happened to him. Uh, well, um, my brother got shot, and my other brother were driving uh, in their car, and uh, they must take the rubbish away from our house uh, in a nearby area where, where, where people put all the rubbish. Uh, and, and that's in the main road uh, near the foot stadium. That's, that's the main road, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, they put the rubbish, and while they were getting back, uh, and they want they want to turn to turn to our road. Um, at that moment, um, you know, a shot came from from nowhere. We, we don't know where it came from. So of course, there's a building um, near near the stadium. Opposite the stadium, we believe that there's a sniper there, mm -hmm. and and he was the one who shot my brother. Well, we're terribly, um, Kanal, we're terribly sorry about that. I said that um, on Wednesday, and of course it's worth repeating. We're terribly sorry for your loss, and we appreciate you coming on and and talking about it again. That's Kanal with us from Tripoli, and Amal, listening to Kanal describing how his brother was killed because he had to take the rubbish out because there's no one picking up the rubbish, there's no one uh, doing anything for civilians at the moment. Do you think that uh, the NTC, the National Transitional Council, should have been ready to put those kind of civic roles, civic support in place immediately that they got control of the capital? Um, I know the NTC has put a lot of planning into Tripoli. It has been on the thoughts of everybody since the beginning of the revolution. The local councils are there. Hearing Kamal speak just reminds me of you know, a couple months ago, it was a situation in Misrata where dead bodies, people weren't even allowed to go out on the street to collect them because there were snipers stationed by Gaddafi forces on the rooftops. And so they were left to, you know, just sit there and having to put up with the stench of the rotten corpses of their families. I mean, it is an atrocious situation that these people have been put in. And I know that the NTC, you know, has worked so tirelessly for liberation of Tripoli. And it, I don't expect it to be long. They are all there to do what they can. These are, after all, their brothers, their sisters, their colleagues, their friends. And everyone is fighting to free them. Thank you very much, Amal. I can see that CNN correspondent Awa Damon has tweeted, 17-year-old fighter wants to be ambassador, says the first thing when this is over, I want to see my mother and get rid of this gun. Um, I can see a tweet from the Daily Telegraph's Rob Crilly, who says, sounds like the NTC move to Tripoli is rather more, rather cosmetic at the moment. They have tent in the Defusa Mountains, commute in for meetings. Um, and it's worth reiterating, there's this African Union uh, meeting in Addis Ababa at the moment. We know that the AU won't be recognizing the rebels while the situation is fluid, to use President Zuma's words. Um, President Zuma has also called for an immediate ceasefire. Um, however, all reports from Libya suggest that call has not been heeded. Uh, we'll get a little break here on World Have Your Say. Do keep calling us, though. We'll get through as many of your calls as we can. The number is country code 44 2070 83 72 72. And we'll always call you back so you won't have to pay for too much of the call. Hi, this is Ross Atkins with you on World Have Your Say. Of course, we're talking about Libya. The whole world has been watching all of this week as events have unfolded. Um, at the moment, uh, no crucial developments in the past few hours. We understand that Abu Salim, the suburb in Tripoli, where there's been fierce fighting, is largely now under the control of the rebels. The rebels, too, are heading towards Colonel Gaddafi's hometown of Siat but they haven't arrived. The only development overnight there was that the British attacked a bunker previously used by Colonel Gaddafi in the city. I can see that we've got calls coming in from Sweden, Iraq, Ghana, India, South Africa, Bangladesh, Cameroon, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Norway, Nigeria and Eritrea. It's a long list. We'll do our best to get as many of you on the air as we possibly can. Remember also, we'll be joined by the BBC's Lise Doucette to answer some of your questions 
in the next few minutes. Um, Amal is still with us. She works at the Libyan Embassy in London. She's also previously uh, done some work with the NTC. Um, but before we speak to Amal again, let's bring in Dania, who is live with us from Dubai and has been following the situation in Libya very closely. She has friends and family there. Um, Dania, I know from speaking to you on World Have Your Say's radio edition, your brother is one of the rebel fighters. Have you spoken to him since he arrived in Tripoli? Um, yeah, I was able to speak with him actually today uh, in the morning. And he told me, don't worry, everything is okay, um, he's safe. Because we weren't able to get in contact with him for a couple of days. The telecommunication system was, you know, on and off. And, and it was really hard to get um, people, you know, to, to even contact your family. So, alhamdulillah, we were able to, to get him through. And I want to ask him. you more about what he's experienced and what you've heard. But we have made a connection to Nizar in Tripoli. And we're having such difficulties getting through to people on Skype and on the phone that uh, when we do, we must go to them straight away. Nizar, thank you for joining us. Tell us about the situation in your part of Tripoli today. Well, um, uh, where I am in Tripoli, which is quite central, um, there's still a, a great sense of euphoria as, as to what's happened in the last few days. Um, we are in the midst of a blackout. There is still shooting in and around uh, Tripoli, and there's still no water. Things aren't perfect, but the, the community is uniting, it's coming together, and, uh, and um, this unity is, is helping us through an uncertain period, but a real historic period here in Tripoli. You say there's no water. Presumably there is some. Where are you getting the water that you're drinking at the moment? Well, there is absolutely no running water. Uh, there's drinking water available um, just through what we've all stocked up in anticipation for zero hour, but there's no running water. Uh, the only people who have running water in their homes are those who have tanks, which uh, are lucky enough to, to be already full. And in terms of being able to leave the buildings where you are, is that possible or are you all having to stay indoors at all times? Absolutely possible. I really have to stress, while there are still pockets of insecurity, um, I'm able to travel around through numerous districts in Tripoli, uh, Al Hadba, Ben Ashur, uh, Mezran, Feshloum, many, many districts uh, in safety. There are a lot of checkpoints, a lot of people are armed, mm -hmm. um, but there is beginning to become relative normal movement on the streets here in, in the central districts. Nizar, thank you very much indeed for giving us your perspective from Tripoli. We're going to get another perspective from Tripoli now from the BBC's Lise Doucette, who joins us live. Uh, welcome to World Have Your Say, Lise. Good to be with you, Ross, and all of our World Have Your Say viewers and listeners. Um, we've told everyone on Facebook and Twitter that you were going to be on taking questions. We've got quite a long list, so we'll get through as many as we can, starting with Sahaja, who's got in touch on Facebook. She's in India and would like to say to you, I've not seen any women or children in the coverage. Are they able to live a dignified life in these conditions? And is there much trauma visible among them? Well, it's a hard time. First of all, thank you for the question from India. It's great that you're, you're following these momentous developments in Libya. It's a hard time for everyone, but it's a very exciting time. I did run into a woman uh, who did, she was in tears because she had tried to take over a new place to live now that the government and Gaddafi loyalists are out most of the city and then the rebels came in um, and, she, and she said they told her to leave and she said, I have four children and finally I have a place to live and the rebels pushed me out. But for the most part, most women I I've met on the streets, and I've met a lot of children on the streets too. They say they're happy with what has happened. I think it's a good thing for everyone if Libya is a safe and a prosperous and a country which feels proud of its leadership. And it seems the majority of people want that to be a leadership in a post Gaddafi era. Here's another question for you from India. Ramath would like to say when will we stop calling them the rebels? Well, in fact, that's what the rebels always say to me. They say we're called freedom fighters. And it's a good question because every time I say it on air, I'm thinking, when do you make the transition from being a rebel to being a government in waiting to being the real government? I think it's a good question and, and you're going to see it and hear it on the BBC shortly when they come to the capital and they start taking charge. But for now, we still have the two sides because they're still fighting between the pro-Qaddafi fighters 
and the rebels. So for the moment, while it isn't over, we're going to have to keep those distinctions clear. Lise, thanks for that answer. Rama, thank you very much for tweeting us that question. Let's shift from India to Kenya. Here's an email from Steve. He says, rebels appear to be targeting black-skinned people in Tripoli. They think blacks are sympathizers of Gaddafi. This is wrong. It should be condemned, and the leadership of rebels should tell their fighters to stop it. Now, the reason we read this one to you, Lise, is that we've noticed online there's a great deal of speculation about whether sub-Saharan Africans have been fighting for Gaddafi and whether they've been targeted by the rebels. What can you tell us, uh, what firm facts do you have on this issue? This is a very, it's a very good question because it's a very sad reality and I've noticed this ever since I began coming again to, to Libya in February when the uprising began. There are a lot of Africans who are here doing a, a decent, fair job every day, but there are also Africans who are here who've been hired by Colonel Gaddafi to fight for him as mercenaries. And unfortunately, the two sometimes get mixed up. They get thrown into detention centers together. We've seen people who've been brought here. They have no entrance stamps. They've been brought in from neighboring African countries, put into the fight. I think it's really important that distinctions be made to treat every African who's here as an individual and to find out what their real stories are and that they're not targeted. But it's really important to, to flag this up, and I'm very glad that you have. And by the way, those of you watching, if ever you want to ask Lee's questions directly, her Twitter address is BBC Lee's Doucette. Now, Lee's, let me introduce you to two Libyan women. Dania is in Dubai. Amal is in London. Both have questions for you. Dania, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for coming to Libya and especially Tripoli and reporting what is going on because a lot of people are misinformed and, you know, are unclear about what the situation is in Tripoli because Gaddafi has such a, you know, a tight hold on the media. Um, my question to you is how, what, how much of a change have you seen with you reporting media when Gaddafi was in power in Tripoli and when the revolutionaries were in power in Tripoli, are in power in Tripoli now? And you, first of all, great, great to be talking to you across, across the airwaves on, on the BBC. And I have to say that me and my colleagues have been treated with great kindnesses, uh, whether we were in Benghazi or in Tripoli or traveling between the two. Great, great people, and we hope for the best uh, for, for the Libyan people. Thank now, you. in terms of the reporting, I would hope, and, but it's up to you, our viewers, to decide, is that I would hope that the way the BBC and other media report this story is the same, whether the, Colonel Gaddafi is in power or whether the, re the rebels or the new, the new leadership is in power. We have to apply the same kind of standards. And we've been reminding ourselves, for example, Amnesty International has done a report, and the ICRC has also flagged up, that abuses have been committed by both sides. It's important that we apply the same yardstick to both sides in this conflict, because the whole story has to be told. But I also have to tell you, Daniel, that since I've been here, a number of people have come up to me and said, one guy said, hello, my name is Tony, or in fact, I used the name Tony on the BBC, but now I can tell you what my real name is because I'm no longer afraid to give my identity. So it makes it a lot easier for us to tell the story when Libyans feel free and safe to tell the story. Lise, thanks for answering that question. Dania, thanks for asking. Amal, you'll have to um, hold your thoughts till um, after the half-past news because we're coming up to that now. I can see um, some news just in. The radical Islamist group in Nigeria, Boko Haram, says it carried out the attacks in Abuja on the UN offices there. We'll bring you more on that here on BBC World News. <laughs> On today's World Have Your Say, we're continuing the BBC's coverage of the situation in Libya. If you're watching there, do tell us what's happening where you live. And if you're enthused by the developments of the past few days, uh, tell us why. You can call us up on country code 44 2070 83 72 72. To the rest of you, I'd say, we'll have all the latest from Libya and we're using the comments and questions that you're sending to shape our coverage. So if you're tweeting, please use the wise hashtag and you'll see our phone and our text numbers are on the screen. They'll be there throughout the show.
And as ever on World Have Your Say, if you do call us, we will call you back, so you won't have to pay for very much of the call at all. But before we do speak to some of you, let's bring ourselves up to date with the latest from Libya and elsewhere. There's been sporadic fighting in Tripoli, and the search is still going on for Colonel Gaddafi. He remains defiant, though. He's used his spokesman to reiterate that he is still in command of the country, even though the evidence may suggest otherwise. Meanwhile, rebel fighters are making slow progress in their advance on Gaddafi's hometown of Siat. This despite assistance from the British, who carried out overnight missile attacks on a large bunker in the city. At least 16 people have been killed in a suicide attack at the UN's building in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. 60 people have been taken to hospital and many of them are in a critical condition. UN sources say the Islamist militant group Boko Haram has issued a threat against the UN building and security has been stepped up. And in the past few minutes, that militant group has told the BBC it carried out the attack. Anti-government activists in Syria say that forces loyal to President Bashar al-Assad fired at protesters in a Damascus suburb after Friday prayers. They have also organized demonstrations today in various Syrian cities. We've got new figures in the U.S. which suggest that its economy almost came to a halt in the first six months of the year. That's cut the country's annual growth forecast, as you'd imagine. We'll find out what the head of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, thinks about all of this. He's addressing a conference of international bankers later on. And the U.S. East Coast is preparing for Hurricane Irene. Seven states, including North Carolina, Connecticut and New York, have declared a state of emergency, with many people urged to evacuate ahead of landfall. <laughs> Well, during the first half of World Have Your Say, we've had calls from France, Tanzania, Mali, UAE, Canada, Sierra Leone, Finland and Sudan. We'll try and get some more of you on the air in the next 30 minutes. Remember, if we don't get you on uh, during this edition, we're also on the radio for two hours on BBC World Service Radio later on. And we'll be back here on BBC World News at 18.30 GMT for World Have Your Say Extra. Here's an email from Mustafa in Minnesota. Actually, not an email. He posted this at facebook.com slash world have your say. He says... Since when has the West and NATO promoted freedom, human rights or anything positive? Imperialists masquerading as saviours. This will be way worse than Iraq or Afghanistan. And I do wonder, Amal, who's still with us, she works at the Libyan Embassy in London. Amal, I do wonder if you feel that what's being achieved in Libya is undermined to some extent by the fact you're not doing it alone as the Egyptians did and as the Tunisians did. Not at all. I mean, there's no sense of pride in these matters. There was a request from the Libyan people for assistance because they understood the strength and the brutality of the regime which they were working to overrule. So there was a never-ending sense of gratitude to, you know, foreign nations for helping them, for implementing the flow Eye Zone, because I can tell you without a doubt that there was this genuine and sincere fear that had the West not intervened, Benghazi and the eastern parts of Libya would have been completely obliterated. And Amal, I did promise that you'd have a chance to ask Lise Doucette a question. I'm afraid that um, a combination of technical problems and the fact that she needed to go rather quicker than we thought meant that um, she's had to leave us, so sorry about um, that. Now, you're live here in London. Let's bring in two more guests. Saeed is with us from Dubai, and Nizar is still live with us from Tripoli. Nizar is a British Libyan. We'll see him in just a moment. That connection has just fallen off, but never mind. Let's speak to Saeed in Dubai. And um, Saeed, I can remember speaking to you a while ago. You had grave doubts about what the rebels were doing in Libya. What's your perspective now? Well, I still have those doubts because uh, even though the rebels have 99% run over the country and taken power most of the places, but I still feel that, you know, they still have ammunition, AK-47 in their hands, and it's in the hands of common people. When will they give up their arms and, you know, when will they get in, back into the society pre-revolution? Uh, That's what I'm still afraid of. Yes, Gaddafi is gone. And I just, I mean, I would like to see some kind of a peaceful transition 
that you know if they they can do that, I mean, I, it would be good. And it's it's, it's been you know that, that's what is my major concern has been from before in the last program also that I was here. That's what I was saying was after Gaddafi is gone, there are so many tribes, they will all be fighting for power. I mean, who are we going to give the power to us? Because there is no, uh, there is not a leader we cannot see, and a charismatic leader is not there like Gaddafi used to be. Well, you list your concerns. Amal, what would you say to Saeed about those concerns? I think they're concerns that, you know, are shared by all, including the NTC and including the people of Libya. Certainly there is an undeniably a large amount of weapons around, but I can tell you that having spent five months on the ground in Benghazi, you know, as a single British Libyan woman not knowing anyone in the city, for all the arms that are floating around, there has been, you know, it was very peaceful. I was never... I never felt threatened, but certainly because we understand the potential for things to go wrong. It is that, that unnerving sense. But so far, there is a genuine understanding. The arms were there. People were protecting themselves and protecting others. But there was no, there was no mass looting. There's no, you know, people going around and firing indiscriminately at other people. They're all there and feel that the weaponry gives them a sense of protection against, you know, be it snipers or unknown security forces. But the NTC has also made it an effort and will continue to do so because they themselves are aware of the need to do so, is to have all those weapons registered and begin to, you know, demobilize, you know, a very armed to the teeth population. And Amal and Saeed, let's bring in Nizar into your conversation because we've made uh, a good connection now. Nizar, we're talking with, with Saeed and Amal about Saeed's concerns that there are now so many men uh, with guns, there's so few police in Libya that it could become an incredibly dangerous place. What would you say to Saeed about those concerns? Well, it, well it's definitely a, a valid concern, but, but we, we have to see... Um, see this through. It's unfortunate that this uprising, this revolution, had to take uh, an armed um, appearance, if you like. It, it, it had to become an armed uprising. It's a shame. And you're right, there are a lot of arms on the streets, certainly in Tripoli. Um, but there is a big drive to see this phase of liberation through, this armed phase through, in order to get to a phase um, where we can implement a, a gun amnesty. Uh, and get into a more peaceful, more transitional, democratic uh, phase of, of Libya's future. Said. Well, well, we, we, this is very good. I mean, I mean, it, it sounds very good, but can it be done with so many different factions in Libya on the ground? And the ground reality is, is, is extremely different than what we are sitting out of Libya and discussing about this. And my major concern is now that we have a, co I mean, the Libyans, uh, the NTC has a common enemy, and that's Gaddafi right now. And after this common enemy has been eradicated, uh, what, who becomes the common enemy? How do they unite with each other? And, and how will they de-weaponize? I mean, you know, the, the NATO dropped weapons from air, and, you know, and, the, and, and the, uh, how will NATO come back and pick it up? Will they give back? I mean, there are so many things that... Okay, sorry, there, be, there are two clear, clear issues there. One Libyan unity, one arms. Amal, let's look at Libyan unity. Do you think there's a risk your country might... Shatter now, Gaddafi's not there to keep you all together. I, I don't have that here. I didn't have that fear to begin with, and I don't have that fear because beyond the, you know, the united animosity against Gaddafi, there is also a unity about the, where they want to go. Everybody there is fighting for the same cause, and that alone is enough incentive. Everybody understands what needs to be done. Everyone is aware of the challenges, and there's no one saying it's going to be easy. Certainly, there are going to be tensions. There are in any national society, but that sense of unity, I genuinely believe, you know, it may take some time, and it won't be easy, but I, there's no way that they're going to let this country fall apart after having just liberated it from 42 years' worth of autocratic rule. Nizar, come in here. Can there be unity in towns like Misrata, Zawir, where there's been such bitter fighting? Uh, I, I, can, I can tell you this. Right here, where I am right now, on the streets of Tripoli, the unity, the coming together of communities is, is such that I have never seen in this country. Um, there is no electricity, there's no running water, there's a shortage of food, there's insecurity. But, but the joy of the street and the community spirit that exists can only give us confidence for the future. Um, it, can only, it can only be positive for, for, the, for the coming. I believe that the strength of our unity, the strength of our desires to reach the common objective will get us through. And I, can, and I can reassure you, I can assure you this, the people that are armed on the streets of Tripoli today would like nothing more than to give their weapons back Absolutely. or put them away.
Sai, do you feel like you've had some of your concerns addressed? Yes, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a very positive and very encouraging, you know, uh, comments that's coming out, and uh, I, I really hope that all the population in Libya can 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 can, can unite under this umbrella because you know uh, the freedom that they're tasting after 42 or 43 years is going to be, you know, the, it, it's it's just overwhelming, and I just hope that they that they can control their emotions and the freedom that they have got and constructively put their energy into some kind of a government where, you know, they can just be better than what they were during the Gaddafi period. Mm -hmm. And Gaddafi was not, you know, Gaddafi was bad. I'm not a pro-Gaddafi person, but he had a system that he had formed and the system was running. Now, all they got to do is, you know, get all their heads together and try to not make it another Iraq or another neighboring, uh, you know, any other country because we have a history and we have a geographical background. It's not that far and we are obviously the same religion, same groups, the same Africans and Arabs and so I, I really hope and I pray that, uh, yes, this thing will resolve by itself and people will de-weaponize by themselves and voluntarily give up their weapons because there is no, there, there is no, uh, uh, what should I say, there is no list or there is no um, um, a list of weapons that has how much weapons have been dropped into uh, and I suppose, Libya by, I mean, by We've NATO. heard anecdotal evidence of rebels saying the moment this is over we want to get rid of our guns, but of course... There will I be others so. who would like to hold on to them, and it remains to be seen what happens in those circumstances. Syed, thank you very much for the moment. Nizar in Tripoli as well, and Amal here in London. We've had a call from Cairo. I think this is uh, for you, Amal, saying, um, we've changed the flag at the Libyan embassy in Cairo, and we're very proud about it. Um, that call was taken by the World Have Your Say team, and Ben is one of them, uh, with them as well. Ben, what kind of calls have you been taking? Well, most people broadly pleased with the direction of things in the last week in Libya. I was just talking to uh, Bakary, a Gambian in New York. He says he wants to commend what he calls the gallant sons of Libya. Some people also calling in to back Gaddafi, though. Tighter in Cameroon, Abdullah in Saudi Arabia. He said uh, Libyans will regret it, that Gaddafi was an amazing leader for so many years and that Libya will be like Somalia, he says. And also people calling to comment on the African Union's role. Lady in Tanzania is disappointed uh, that the African Union haven't recognised what he calls the changes in Libya, although Amir in Switzerland supports their stance. Now, our radio edition in just over an hour on BBC World Service Radio will discuss these things too. We're also going to talk about the other huge story on Twitter and Facebook uh, you're talking about today. That's the explosion in Abuja earlier on. Um, people reacting to the claim of responsibility that's uh, been had in the last hour or so. And people also posting appeals to give blood for the injured in Abuja. I've just seen this tweet from Jamal. Uh, the devastating bomb blast, he says, in my nation's capital, Abuja, was a terrible experience and it breaks my heart. Ben, thank you very much indeed. You're talking about that claim of responsibility. This is Boko Haram. The Islamist group has told the BBC it carried out uh, the car bomb attack on the UN office in Abuja. Let's pull up um, this message from Emmanuel. He phoned us a little earlier to say, my sister works for the UN and I work nearby. I heard the blast and rushed down to check on my sister. She was OK, but I saw so many injured people, so many dead bodies. It was terrible. And we'll talk about that further on World Have Your Say's radio edition. We'll be back here on BBC World News Television, though, to talk about the situation in Libya a little further after this break. Hi, this is Ros Atkins with you on World Have Your Say. And of course, we're talking about Libya. We've said goodbye to Saeed in Dubai, but we're welcoming back Dania, who is on the same camera. Dania, thank you very much indeed for coming back. We're also uh, going to be speaking some more with Nizar, who's live with us from Tripoli on Skype. And we're bringing in Chris Stevens, he writes for the Guardian newspaper. He's been living in Misrata, the Libyan city of Misrata, for several months now. Chris, um, good to speak to you on World Have Your Say. First of all, what is the situation in Misrata today? Well, the situation is they're braced for another offensive. Um, there's a lot of units going uh, south at the moment, uh, bringing tanks and heavy weapons and so on, um, to attack Sirte, which is Gaddafi's birthplace. Um, and there's a certain urgency to this because they're, they're launching Scud missiles against Misrata. We've had several in the last few days, each one of which has been intercepted. But, of course, the, the fear is that one of them is going to get through. So I think the rebels want to, to establish dominance over Sirte before, before that happens. 
Um, and I know that we had one email from Tan Chi Singh in China who wanted to ask why would the rebels be, and NATO in particular, be focusing on Seert because, uh, after all, the purpose of NATO's mission is to protect civilians and uh, Gaddafi's forces are not going to attack civilians in his strongest town. So you've been down the road to see it or near to it. And why the tactics of going for that city? Um, well, I can't speak for NATO, but I mean, the, the Certe is certainly busy, busy attacking Misrata. I mean, two nights ago, there was this titanic explosion above our heads, which I'm told was a, was a missile fired from Certe, one of these scuds, and it was intercepted by an American missile from, from the Mediterranean, from one of these NATO ships. And we've had four scuds fired from from CERT. So I know, at the moment, what the rebel leaders are trying to do is say to the CERT people, look, you know, you have to stop firing these scuds. You have to lay down your weapons, and there has to be some way in which we can police that because there is a great fear around here. I mean, they've had six months of bombardment, and now to have these scuds coming in is something they they really don't want. So, I mean, I think NATO would say, well, we are protecting civilians because we have CERT firing these missiles. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I know you need to go, Chris, so thank you for your contribution. That's Chris Stephen, live with us from Miss Rata. I can see calls coming in from America, Poland, Benin and St. Lucia. Let's shift from Miss Rata back to Tripoli and speak to Karen, who's a Scottish woman who's working as a nurse in Tripoli. Karen, good to speak to you again. I know we spoke a few days ago on the radio. Describe to us the situation in the hospital where you're working. Uh, good afternoon. Hi. Today um, we're having a quieter day, um, which is quite good for us. Um, yesterday was the worst day that we've actually had for a number of casualties that we actually received. Um, so we're quite glad of the respite today. Thank you for speaking to us, Karen. I'll keep it brief because I know you're tight for time too. Let's bring in Dania in Dubai. Dania, you were telling us about your brother who's been a rebel fighter. How long do you think he'll remain a rebel fighter before he goes back to being a businessman. Um, he wants to stay as long as possible, and his main goal was, you know, leaving Dubai. He's not going to come back until Tripoli is free. And even then, he's, he wants to stay back because, I mean, we've been exiled from our country for so many years, so why leave it? And the whole point of this whole revolution is to build our country back and to make it, you know, the best country possible. Now, we have three um, Libyans I also... who... Can I just ask all three of you? We've got three Libyans here, all of whom live outside of Libya at the moment. Just very quickly, will you be moving back uh, if Colonel Gaddafi's driven from power? Daniel? Yes, of course, without any question. Amal? Yeah, I've, having spent five months there, I can't wait to get back there and can help contribute in any way I can. And Nisa, you're a British Libyan. You're temporarily in Tripoli. Will you be making that your permanent home? Um, I, I'm not entirely yet sure. Um, certainly, I'll be back and forth. But, um, but my, my objective. And as your Skype field. line gives up the ghost, Nizar, the timing is very good. We've been very lucky speaking to you on that line. It sounds like it's finally um, packing up. Thanks to Amal, thanks to Dania and to Nizar, and of course to all of you who have been calling up. We've had a great many calls. We'll carry on the conversation on BBC World Service Radio in just over an hour. Speak to you very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>